Thanks to the Tamarisk Coalition for hosting this. Um, and when I was looking through, I, I noticed that my talk was the only one where the title was actually longer than the abstract. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not even going to say the title. But uh, when I was initially asked to do this talk, um, I wanted to do it in a way that would let everybody know what species of diarabda are out there, where they are, and where they came from. So it was, it was an, more to inform you. Um, I'm really relying on the work of a lot of people that have been uh, that that have been on the project for many years, and that's why I do have several uh, photos of people that have worked on the project. Let's see if I can get this right. Um, oh, yeah, yes. Um, the Tamaris Biocontrol Program has been successful across Western North America. And part of the reason for that success is that in the initial stages of the program development, rather than having one collection of a biocontrol agent from one region in Eurasia, which is where Tamaris is from, several collections were made and they could be matched to ecological conditions across North America. Uh, the original diarabda, um, which was originally called diarabda elongata deserticola, was collected from deep in Central Asia at a relatively northern latitude of about 44 degrees. And, sub, and they are subjected to uh, an interior continental climate. When they were first released in 2001, they thrived in some areas, which really correspond to areas that match their homeland, which would be in sort of the more northern part of the Intermountain West. They didn't do well in Texas at all. Uh, they didn't do well in Southern California. Um, so it was obvious that they were going to be successful in some places, but not in other places. And as you can see from this photo, uh, from this slide, they were they were released specifically to avoid southwestern willow flycatcher territory. But in the original documentation of the releases and the petition for this release, it was it was clearly stated that it was expected that they would eventually move into flycatcher territory, but that we we would have uh, restoration programs in place to make up for any detrimental effects of, of, uh, of the beetle and flycatcher habitat. Now that's come along much more slowly than we would have liked. That's a subject for another talk. But uh, back to this one. Diarabda from the northern regions enter diapause or, or the, the overwintering state in response to light cycles and they enter in response specifically to light to day lengths that are shorter than about 14 and a half hours. It happens that in the southern realm of Tamarisk, uh, you don't even reach 14 and a half hours even a, a, on summer solstice. So they didn't do well. They would have one generation and they'd call it quits. And that was part of the reason why they didn't do so well. That's part of their northern adaption. It's part of the reason why they're called the northern Tamarisk beetle. So to make up for this, back in 2001 or so, we started talking about importing other populations of beetle. And we ended up importing populations from across North Africa all the way into Central Asia, trying to hit ecological settings that they would be seeing in North America by collecting these, at the time we called them ecotypes, biotypes, morphotypes, some kind of types. Um, but they came from different parts of the range. <clears throat> about that time and for the next several years um, James Tracy and Tom Robbins spent a lot of time under the microscope determining that based on based on morphology and other characteristics ecological etc these could be divided into uh, a species complex so instead of diarabda elongata we ended up with five species of tamarisk feeding diarabda and of those, we have four of them in play in North America that have been released here. Um, James did the, the morphological studies, and Dave Kasmer followed it up with some DNA sequence studies. And you can see uh, you've already been introduced to, to CO1 sequence analysis. It's a mitochondrial gene. And you can, uh, you can see that the diarabda species, as they were described by James Tracy, fall out into 
into five, where we originally had four, if you look at mitochondrial DNA sequence. And they're, they're definitely well separated um, on the basis of differences in DNA sequence. And you notice that Carinulata, which is the one we have around here and the predominant one in the Intermountain West, really separates out from the other three. Um, and, and here it's four. So um, consider Elongata, which separated out into two, uh, two distinct groups on the basis of mitochondrial DNA. If you switch and look at the whole genome, random amplified fragments from the whole genome, including the nuclear genome, uh, we get a nice separation into four groups that correspond very well to the four, um, to the four species described by Tracy and Robbins. Uh, this is because mitochondria are, are weird. Uh, they're inherited in a strange way, and the DNA metabolism uh, in the mitochondrial genome is different from the nuclear genome. So you often get these um, anomalies in, in mitochondrial uh, DNA sequence analysis. So here's the, uh, the, the native range of diarabda. Um, <clears throat> the Tunisia beetles, which are, have been released in Texas, originally came from North Africa and they wrap around Spain. Um, the elongata beetles, which are called Crete beetles, or in some cases, uh, some were actually released that came from mainland Greece. Uh, those are Eastern Mediterranean, Northeastern Mediterranean. And then Carinata, uh, which were called Uzbek beetles, are sort of the, gra the grasslands of Central Asia. And then stretching out uh, toward Mongolia is the, the native homeland of <coughs> Carinulata, uh, which is the, one, the ones we have around here. So if you look at that, it's not surprising that the internal, the uh, interior west is a, a really nice home for, for, the, for the beetles from Central Asia. So the four species have been, have been studied in, under conditions in North America, and three of them in particular have been released in Texas. The, the reason why um, the, one of the reasons why we initially brought them over was that they do have different responses to, life ci to, to light cycles, and they apparently have different life, uh, life cycles in, under field conditions. Um, and when they were studied in the field um, by the, the Texas group uh, under, under the direction of Jack DeLoach, and here's, here's, um, here's one of the citations on this work, they found that Diarabda elongata, carinata, and sublineata have multiple generations even in the southern part of the range, which is why they're successful there. Uh, Carinulata, as I said before, only one generation, sometimes two in the southern part of the range, which makes it very difficult for their populations to rapidly build. Um, one of the interesting things about carinata, which is an Uzbek beetle, is that they don't have a very deep diapause. They come out early. They'll come out early in the spring, and then they're, they're subjected to being killed by a frost. So, and one of the interesting things about Elongata, that's the Crete beetle, uh, they have a really intense diapause, and oftentimes it can, it can remain warm for a long time before they finally come out. And we've, we've seen this under lab settings. So if you wanted a beetle that was going to do really well in West Texas, you want to avoid those early spring frosts. And... But Carinata, the, the Uzbek beetle, is a grassland beetle adapted to those situations. So you'd want kind of a mix between Carinata and, and Elongata if you're going to do well in the, in the upper, uh, in, in the Texas panhandle in Oklahoma. So keep that in mind. Um, this is some work that was done by uh, Peter Dahlin, who is a, a Swedish scientist, came over two, for two years uh, to, to study, um, to study the Diarabda species complex. Um, I put the red arrow here on, on, in some of Peter's work to show that at 13 hours of light, where normally Carinulata, the beetle we have around here, they would all be dormant. At 13 hours of light, under conditions of temperature that you'd normally find out in the field, let's say in West Texas, they're all reproductive. So there are some very real physiological differences between beetles from Uzbekistan and the ones that originally came from uh, from the interior of Asia. Um, this is just to um, to let you know that there was a large scale redistribution program, implementation program 
carried out in Texas. That's why uh, Texas has a whole range of beetles from, from the Rio Grande all the way up to Oklahoma. And it, and it was under the direction of, of Alan Knutson. Uh, Jack Deloach was part of that project too, and so is James Tracy, who's here today. And beetles were released across West Texas, all three species that we don't have here. <clears throat> and uh, uh, this is the latest Tamaris Coalition map showing the distribution of beetles in Western North America, not including uh, Nevada and Oregon, where they're also present in large numbers. But uh, you can see that there's a large blob of beetles in, in Utah, Western Colorado, and then some out, some out in Arkansas. That's, that's what you can see in Colorado, sort of in the, the southeastern corner of the state. And then they're moving southward uh, into Arizona and New Mexico. Those are all Carinulata. Uh, slowly moving southward, but you can see all up and down West Texas and entering into New Mexico, there's a whole new batch of beetles, and they're moving northward into uh, into Oklahoma now. Those are a combination of Carinata elongata and Sublineata, uh, and Carinulata are in the interior. Now, I've included a little bit of work on the, the the notion that there can be hybridization between sibling species or closely related species, and that is also that's also true for these beetles. And I've shown a, a very tasteful photo of mating because uh, the next and the next couple of slides have to do with mating between uh, between the the species of Diarabda. And these are two of the people that worked on that project too: Dave Thompson out of uh, New Mexico State and Dave Kasmer, formerly of the USDA. Uh, this is, a, I have a couple of experimental slides, not many, but here's one of them. Um, this, is, this is our protocol for looking at viability of hybrids. Uh, you mate the two, um, you mate the two species. In all cases, we get hybrids out of them. We get living hybrids, and then the real experiment is to see if those hybrids are themselves viable. And another part of the experiment is to see if they can be back crossed into the parental generation. So the result of these experiments really comes from the hybrids from the initial cross mating with each other or mating back into the parental generation. And then we also wanted to know if there was any difference between a male hybrid and a female hybrid, if one has more viability than the other. So we would do a cross between male hybrid and the original species and, and or female hybrid and the original species to see if there's any difference between that. So the outcome is really four. Um, um, four back crosses and one hybrid hybrid cross. And here is uh, Diarabda perennialata crossed with Diarabda elongata originally also known as the Crete beetles, and you can see that the egg viability of these hybrids and hybrid back crosses is very low. What you can also see, if you look down on the x-axis, you can see CR slash HY, that's Carinulata, male, and a hybrid female. You get some eggs, but anytime you throw a hybrid male into this mix, you get no eggs at all. So in this particular cross, the hybrid males are sterile, and the hybrid females aren't too much better. We did that with all with the three possible combinations of Carinulata and the three other species, and found in all cases that once you got one generation into this hybridization scheme, there was very low egg viability, and there were also some there were some other problems. There was actually one that we call death by mating, which is kind of gruesome, but sometimes they would die in the act of mating, in fact, quite, quite often. So um, we considered that to be really a very unlikely hybridization potential in the field. Uh, when you cross the three other species with each other, this is, this is typical, I won't go through them all, but um, the hybrid crosses were often extremely viable. So that means that the three species Sublineata, Carinata, and Elongata are capable of crossing with each other. There's capa capability of getting genetic 
exchange in the field. Um, and that also probably is a function of the fact that they're mo more closely genetically related. So we came up with a scheme. It's very likely that Elongata, Sublineata, and Carinata will cross in the field. Far less likely that there'll be much gene flow between Carinulata and the three. Um, right about the time we were finishing that work, um, Jerry Michaels and his, his, his group from West Texas started noticing that the beetles that had originally been, been inter, introduced into Texas and that were really moving along slowly started to pick up in speed uh, in terms of population expansion and dispersal. And uh, Jerry and his group did some surveys and they found Carinata, Elongata, and hybrids present in the field. Um, so we had expected this, we just didn't expect it to happen so quickly. Um, and his group um, continues to, to follow the progress of, of hybrid movement between Texas, um, Oklahoma, Kansas. Uh, James Tracy's in, involved in this group and he does, he does some of the identification based on morphological traits. But they are moving and it's a, it's a hybrid population. And when I, when I talked about Carinata and Elongata and how if you could have a combination of a couple of the features of those two populations, you might have a beetle that did really well uh, in, in the plains. And that seems to be the case. And you can, this is taken from the, this is a, a redo of the Tamas Coalition map. And you can see expansion of, you can see the expansion of the Carinata, Elongata, and hybrid group uh, really picking up some steam between 2012 and 2013. And this, what, this is what seems to be happening. They have a slow movement of Carinulata southward and a rather a rapid expansion northward of the, DL, uh, the Elongata, Carinata, and hybrid mix moving northward. Uh, for people here from Colorado, particularly from the, the Arkansas Basin, we expect that we expect that movement along the Arkansas will bring uh, these, these beetles into the lower Arkansas Basin probably next summer, but you know, maybe the summer after. It's very likely that they'll get there soon. Um, so what, what we're projecting is a rapid expansion northward um, into the Arkansas drainage. We're also expecting that the hybrids, and it seems to be the case, the hybrids because they have a, a rich genetic mix, are able to overcome some of the physiological limitations that the parental uh, beetles had, and that uh, Carinulata will continue to move southward um, in, in the Colorado River Basin, but slowly due to physiological limitations, and that Tamarisk will decline uh, wherever there are beetles. I mean, we've heard that before, um, but now we're pretty confident that given the genetic background of the beetle populations uh, that we have in Western North America, that they'll they'll end up in most drainages um, of the West where there where there are uh, where there are tamarisk stands. And I, I put this in here. This is a this is a slide. This is a Jack Deloach slide um, showing the decline of of tamarisk in in West Texas uh, under the under the constant herbivory of Diarabda elongata, or the, the Crete beetles. Um, at that point, they weren't given species status. But you can see what happens, and I think that's kind of a common theme for beetle uh, herbivory on tamarisk. A decline of, the, of tamarisk, uh, opening up of the canopy, um, eventual death of a certain portion of the population. And I'd like to thank um, Sonia Ortega for some of the maps and the Palisade Insectary and then Jack Deloach for uh, really getting this work going, and, and James Tracy, who's here, for doing, doing a lot of the uh, initial biogeography and, and morphological examination of, uh, of the beetles. Um, I think we might have time for questions. Yeah, I think we have time for two quick questions. Um, 
They did. Um, that was Carinolata, and they did. They're very slow in Wyoming. Um, they are beginning to note a decline uh, of, um, of tamarisk stands in a lot of places in Wyoming, but it, it's really slow, and a lot of the releases didn't take. Um, Well, we um, the species came came to us originally. We we did the collections and we keep we keep the population separated. We don't do field collected material for those experiments. And then we were doing um, quality control, as it were, um, by even in within our cultures. While we were doing those experiments, we would remove some beetles and send them to Dave Kasmer, who who did uh, the Co1 and AFLP work, and he would he would send us back his information on what they were, we'd give them to him blind, blind test. And he'd, he would assure that our colonies were what we thought they were during the course of those experiments. 